Alright peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of Sifu Imin looking like Rambo 3 up in here, lots of, you know that Wing Chun guy on Instagram with the videos all sped up? Why is that? Cause he's a bullshit artist. Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? Sifu, I am Gooch City. You are Gooch? Do you know what the Gooch is? The Gooch is from Different Strokes. Different World. No, I think, you, I think you're thinking of Boner from, different from Growing Pains. The Gooch. Do you know what the Gooch is if you just say the Gooch? Well, okay, the Gooch no, was no. a bully Hold on. in Different Strokes. Okay, Dre, I got homework for you. After today's episode... Gooch is Gucci. I'm good. After today's episode... <laughs> I want you to go on, on this site called Google.com. No. And I want you to type in Gooch no. slang. Okay? Gooch slang. And then we'll, dis we'll make the whole entire next episode about the Gooch. Okay? <laughs> All right, Dre. So what do you got for me? Okay. Let's go straight into it. All right. <laughs> like the turnpike. Mikel Lavarez Chavez. All right. Coming shout out. Coming straight out the gate. Straight Yo, out of the gate. Come like on, you are he coming might be straight out of the gate. Dear what you say? Like you might be one of yous. you. What do you mean? A, a like Kung a, Fu genius? Like a Cubans. Cubans, yeah, I think this guy is Cuban. Okay, from, cool. But actually from Cuba, not like me. I'm a fake half Cuban who grew up in Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay, good afternoon, Sifu Alex Richter. He doesn't mention us. Nah, he doesn't give a flying shit about you guys. Greetings from Cuba. Greetings. Thank you for helping to make known and understand part of the history of Wing Chun. I would like to ask you two questions. Two questions. All right, here we go. I had to edit it out. Oh. Yeah, we actually wrote 10. Yeah, he actually wrote 10 <laughs> questions. Yeah, but we, but we, got we, we cannot dedicate an entire episode to one person. <laughs> First, what could you tell me about Sifu Imin Bostepe? Uh -huh. His contribution to the world of Wing Chun both as an instructor and as a fighter. All right. That's a great fighter. question. That's a great question. It's a potential precarious minefield of politics and old wounds within WT. But uh, I, I think I mean... I love footage. I love the footage, the famous footage of Bostepe beating ass in like a tournament. A t oh, you mean the demonstration? That That's actually yeah. uh, called the Budo Gala. Mm. And uh, every year, I don't know if they still do it. They had it back in the day when I lived in Germany. Yeah. And it's like a yearly thing called the Budo Gala, which is basically a big martial arts show. Mm -hmm. And it would be like in a big gymnasium or a small stadium. And they would have martial arts, martial artists from all different styles. And they would also have like martial arts celebrities. So like every year... The EWTO, they had a Wing Chun demo there. Mm -hmm. And then like some years, Chuck Norris would come. Other wow. were years, I think, where Van Damme was there. Or like Jean Frenette, who's like a very famous kicker. Mm. And so you would have like this mixed bag of like karate demos and kung fu demos and all this what kind of sugar stuff. Foot? Uh, I, I don't know. Are you used to Superfoot or Sugarfoot? Sugarfoot. Right. Sugar you talk, okay, because <laughs> there, there is a Sugarfoot too. All Who's right? a Sugarfoot? Yeah. Um, I think Peter, Peter Cunningham, right? Ooh. He's actually the, the instructor of uh, one of my good friends, um, AJ Riccardi, who I was actually on his podcast Ooh. a long time. Okay. He was in uh, uh, No Retreat, No Surrender and Writing Wrongs with Cynthia Rothrock. He's nice. like this amazing kickboxer that he teaches out in California. Tell her I said hello, by the way. Cynthia Rothrock? Yeah. Sure, I'll call. I'll, I'll, the yeah, true I'll, rock. I'll, te uh, I'll text her right after today's episode. Okay, thank you. So, um, <laughs> I'm just joking. I don't ever know. So, um, anyway, uh, yeah, Sibu Imin uh, was um, one of the, I think, kind of the pillars of European Wing Chun uh, in the early days, you know, because... Uh, you know, before Wing Chun became, and I'm talking about WT, the Lengting lineage in Europe, before it became this huge juggernaut yeah. that it became like in the 90s and in the 2000s, um, you know, it, it, it was kind of built by some of these young scrappy guys going out there and kind of making a name. So in a similar vein, the EWTO followed a similar template 
to like what Yip Man did in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. having like the first generation of guys there, like your fighters who go out and they establish the reputation of your school, like what you know Wong Sun Leung and William Cheng and all of these guys did for for Yip Man in those the, the, those early days. Um, so it was kind of like similar in the EWTO. So you had all of these early period guys there who were absolute bangers. I mean, mm -hmm. when you look at the when you look at those guys uh, from that generation, I mean, they trained really hard and they, you know, in those early days, they didn't necessarily learn all the advanced techniques so quickly. Like nowadays, it's a, you have a lot more access uh, within WT to learn the advanced program. But back in those days, it was like you kind of learned Siunam Tao and Chumkyu and then your entire world was learning to use those movements to kind of fight all sorts of different types of attacks that would come at you, right? And if you had learned Buji back then, you were like an absolute rock star because that was like secret forbidden stuff. So Sivu Imin, um, who is uh, my Siheng, because we have the same Sivu, our Sivu is Sivu Kernspecht. Uh So he's he's actually my Siheng, but mm -hmm. I will call him Sifu Imin out of respect because he is a Sifu and, and, and that's how most people know him. Um, he's from that early time period and he, you know, obviously, most famous for his scrap with uh, William Cheung. And, um, but he was also like someone who was very present at the time uh, in terms of like, when you look at the magazines, the, the EWTO had a magazine that came out every year, they still do, uh, for mm -hmm. their members called Wing Chun World. Although in the early years, they used to come out quarterly. And when I, was, when I lived in Germany, I collected all of them. So I yeah. have like, I don't have like the recent ones because I haven't been there. Like, so if any of my EWTO friends wanna, shoot me some some of those from i don't know say about 2002 wow. to present day i'd be more than happy yes. but before 2002 i basically collected all of them and they were fascinating because in the early period sifu kanchbrake printed those things himself mm -hmm. and he did it quarterly and there was like you know um uh, answering letters like from members and then there were articles and then he even had like a charlatan of the quarter like because in those days there were a lot of people who were claiming that they were kung fu masters and stuff like that and those were always really funny they would what? have stuff yeah remember one of the charlatan of the quarter was um, <laughs> I mean that's how you translate it into English was this guy from I guess the former Yugoslavia or one of those uh -huh. countries I think it was the former Yugoslavia who claimed that he was one of Yip Man's students. Okay. And that like for the final test in Yip Man's school, he, you had to fight like lions and all these like wild animals and stuff. Because what? you imagine like, first of all, especially in the days of the Iron Curtain, those mm -hmm. guys didn't have access to magazines and books and stuff. So most of what they understood about Chinese martial arts was a bit fantastical, perhaps based on what few movies they were able to see, right? So okay. as Kung Fu and Wing Chun and martial arts in general were getting big in the 70s and 80s, you had some people from countries that didn't have access to stuff like that claiming stuff. And this was a Yugoslavian guy. I mean, at that time, I know Yugoslavia's not a country anymore, but you, you say he's a Yugoslavian, right? By the way, Yugoslavia is the only... Uh, when, when I was a child, my, my, my dad wanted to go into Yugoslavia when it was still... Yugoslavia uh -huh. and uh, because he had never been there before so All my dad right. was always like oh this is one of the few countries I haven't been to so uh, when we were in Germany like in the 80s he wanted to make a detour mm -hmm. and it was the only time in my life I had a machine gun pointed at me okay. yeah because, because we we had stuff that in the trunk uh, we had something. like stuff we bought in Berlin oh right and uh my my mom bought a bunch of china in Berlin at this uh -huh. place called KDW which is like a huge department store it's very famous and she had everything packed up up because we were going to bring it back and it's all like fine china and they wanted to know what was in the box and my mom was like uh, not willing to like unpack all that stuff because it had already been professionally packed yeah and i remember like while they're looking in the trunk like the guy's like holding a machine gun like pointing right at me at through you, the glass because you yeah. are and going in the to front pull a gun out. and and in the back and i yeah. just remember it's just really weird and then we just turned around and we didn't go in oh. probably a good idea <laughs> uh so anyway um so yeah, so you had like all these like charlatans and stuff. So there was this one guy from Yugoslavia who claimed he was a student of Yip Man, a Yugoslavian guy, and that the final test was like fighting lions and shit like that, right? So guy obviously didn't know anything about what's what. So anyway, those magazines were really interesting, and I used yeah. to read those magazines. And you know, in uh, like by the mid '80s, Sifu Amin would feature prominently in there, and so there would be articles about him. And then he used to teach in a, a town called Kassel. Kassel, I believe, is where he's from. I mean, he's, he's, he's Turkish, but I believe that he grew up and lived in Kassel 
at, at some point. And that's where his school originally started. And then mm -hmm. later he branched out and came to the U.S. and all that stuff. So Steve Lehman was very instrumental in in the development of WT as a brand in Europe as, in terms of like being a fighting brand. And um, when you look at him, especially when you see, um, I haven't seen much of him lately. Yeah, but he's when, built like a tank. Yeah, when you, he used to... It's like Rambo. When I was in Germany, I would collect all of these like... Um, uh, anytime WT was in in the news or on TV or anyone, anytime anyone had a video about WT, yeah. uh, of course these are the days of VHS. <laughs> I used to copy all this stuff, so I have at home. I have to convert all this stuff. Oh, uh, wow. I have VHS tapes of like Sifu Amin on TV and Leung Teng teaching police, and I have I have like all this stuff that mm. I need to like put in a digital format before that stuff just rots. Ooh. And uh, there was one demonstration. Mikey that, could help you with this. There's one demonstration that Sifu Amin gave. I will have to say it's got to be the in the 90s, probably the early 90s. And he just, he looked like Rambo from Rambo 3. <laughs> oh, you know what I mean? Okay. Uh, you, you remember how, do you remember how Jack Stallone was in yeah. Rambo 3? I remember, and it was like, I think Steve Amin even put a headband on. I think it looked just like that scene in, in Rambo where he's like getting ready. And his, he was so jacked. And you just look at him and, and he gave, he did a demonstration and it had a black background yeah. and he does some Wing Chun and then he did some Eskrima and it was just like, he just, wow, so yeah. scary, man. Yeah. And there are a lot of people who, who talk shit about him and those are all people who never met him in real life, okay? <laughs> they, because they, everyone's like, ah, Wing Chun, <laughs> this guy, they're, they're, whatever. Yeah. It's like, um, people can have their opinions whether mm -hmm. they like him or not from his personality or from his character or whatever, but... Uh, I did a number of seminars with him before I went to Germany, mm -hmm. and you know everything he taught was really solid, mm -hmm. and he's always really strong and really impressive. And when he's yeah. in front of you, yeah, you know, and you're he, in, it's like Tyson in front of you, exactly, like, right? I'm, Everyone I'm talks shit. It's, it's like you know, how does every Mike Tyson <laughs> joke begin by looking over <laughs> your shoulder, right? How, hey. how does all talking shit about Sifu <laughs> Amin begin yeah. by looking over, over your, your shoulder? shoulder. Okay. Because if he's standing in front of you, you're gonna shit in your pants, right? <laughs> Unless you're like a professional MMA fighter and you're used to be, like if you're a Wing Chun guy yeah. and you talk shit about Emin never having seen him and then you see him, pardon my French, you're going to need to shut the f*** up, right? Okay. I mean, you can have your, like, you know, uh, when when he broke away from the association, it was like, okay, are you going to go with Sifu Emin or are you going to stay with Sifu Leung Teng? Well, my path was to stay with Sifu Leung Teng because I'm, I'm a Kung Fu head, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to learn... Leung Teng Wing Chun from Leung Teng, right? And there was no knock on Sifu Amy, and it was just that I had already done the European style and I had done a number of seminars with him for years. So I felt that, you know, I kind of see, I kind of saw what, what that offering is, but I didn't know what Sifu Leung Teng teaches. That was the great unknown, right? Mm -hmm. So that was part of the reason why I decided to go there. You didn't have any fear of the unknown either. No, but I mean, like, look, if you're doing Leung Teng Wing Chun and you're a big Kung Fu head like me, all right, and then you have the opportunity to learn from Leung Teng, you're going to take it, right? right. And, but that was no knock on Sifu Emin. Um, I always found Sifu Emin to be, you know, very impressive. And his explanations about of closing the gap in the magnetic zone. Yeah. So although most of what I teach is very Hong Kong style, like I teach a Hong Kong style Wing Chun, I maybe teach it in a slightly more updated way or I might have a, 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 a more standardized teaching progression. But my explanation of the magnetic zone, that comes from Sifu Emi, the mm. same one that I teach to this day. That All is right. like his because uh, in terms of like, you know, closing the gap in the magnetic zone and what we call timing one, mm -hmm. he's the absolute boss at that. Wow. And so I still lean into a lot of those old explanations that I got from him, whether it was from his videos or from his seminars, and I still teach it that way. Although maybe the way I construct some my programs are not the same as how he does it. He's the guy that got you into the castle. Uh, well, he didn't right. get me. Well, I wanted to go, but yeah. at that time, if you were going, if you were not from the EWTO and right. you wanted to train at the castle, you needed a letter of recommendation. So he wrote it, but it's not like he knew who I was. Oh. I just, uh, I, I, you know, I had done a couple seminars with him in the States. I was okay. just some, I was just some skinny neck <laughs> white kid that went to his seminars, but I needed, but the castle told me I needed to have permission from my Sifu to go and train there. Mm -hmm. So, um, I contacted the organization in Los Angeles. That's where it was at that time. And, and 
Sifu Amin signed a letter for me, but that does not imply somehow that I had a close oh. relationship with him. It was just a formality. Okay. I gotcha. still have the letter though. Oh. Yeah, I still have sweet. it. Sweet. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's kind of interesting. At some point, maybe when I write the, the, you know, my tales of the Kung Fu genius, I'll throw stuff like that in there. Tales of the Kung um, but no, Fu Sifu Amin uh, is, uh, for me, one of the pillars of WT. I know that that might upset some of my good friends in the EWTO because maybe they're no, they, they're not happy with kind of the political stuff that happened. But you have to be able to separate that, okay? Yeah. Because you can have doesn't take away his kung fu. Yeah, but also like um, relationships are complex, and mm -hmm. when you try to assess someone or what you think about someone, you have to be able to parse out these things because you could have a disagreement with someone politically. And by the way, I don't have any disagreement with him politically. I'm not even in the WT association anymore. So, mm. uh, like my good friend, my good high school friend, Brady said, when it comes to this stuff, I don't give a shit because I don't give a f all right. So, okay. Like that's kind of like, for, I don't care. I don't give right? a shit because I don't give a f Exactly. All right. Okay. That's exactly how I feel about it. I don't mm. give a shit because I don't give a f All right. Okay. Make sure you bleep those out. All right. Okay. So, um, you know, so some people, they cannot separate that, you know, and uh, they, um, so they're like, oh, well, you know, he left or he did this or he said this about it. And like, yeah, all that stuff is true. But we're talking about him as a Wing Chun martial artist. We're not talking about what someone feels about him politically. Right. Mm. And uh, dude, he's a banger, man. I mean, yeah. he's a very, very serious guy. And, and in terms of applying the fundamentals of Wing Chun, I mean, you're not really going to find anyone better. Right. Mm. I don't know much about what he's been up to in recent years. So I, I cannot comment on like what he does now or the current state of what's going on or whatever. But I, I just know in my mind's eye from like 2002 and up to 2002, mm -hmm. that's like the picture I have of him. Yeah, and my fragile kung fu mind, he's a No, legend. just say fragile mind. Fragile yeah. mind. Yeah, you can take kung fu out of that, <laughs> all right? Um, wow. I, I will, he's I, a legend, though. I will say this, however. Uh -huh. um, there, was, there was something that bothered me, not that Sifu Amin did, but there was something that bothered me about... Um, when I came to the US and I started teaching Wing Chun, um, because there was this perception, all right? Remember that um, before 2001, mm -hmm. uh, Sivu Imin was the head instructor of Learn Things US Association. He was the chief instructor, right? So we were all, before then, we were all quote unquote under Sivu Imin, right? And then he decided to leave in 2001, late 2001. I remember it was not too far from September 11th. It was like just right before. All that kind of stuff happened at the same time. Mm. And then uh, Sifu Lang Ting decided to take over the US Association himself and be in charge of the instructors. And then so essentially there, uh, there was a split. Okay, you had, you know, Imin then started what he called EBMAS, you know, the Imin Boss Stepping Martial Arts System, which was his association. And then you had the guys who stayed with Sifu Lang Ting, right? So you had the schism. And then there was this idea that it was like us versus them. But the thing is, it was never that way, all right? Um, because, uh, first of all, America is huge. Every town, every city yeah. has more than enough people to have five EBMAS schools and five IWTA schools, and none of them have to shit on each other. There yeah. are enough people. Huge market. They, they, they always operated with this scarcity mindset, and I mean that on both sides. Like every student that trains at an EBMAS school is a student you've taken away from IWTA and vice versa which is ridiculous, especially mm. here in New York when you look at the population, right? There, there was this real hardcore scarce, scarcity mentality that, you know, oh, how many students do they have? As if every student they have is a student they've taken away from you, which is, if you don't have students, that's not someone else's fault. That's your fault, yeah. all right? Yeah. But it was easy because that was kind of the culture within WT was to kind of blame. So when I came to the States in 2002 and I opened City Wing Chun, the only thing I was focused on was like getting more students, all right? And online, there's all this like chatter, like, oh no, see if Alex is the Larrington guy, but there was an EBMAS school here in New York. Okay. But the thing is, I knew some of those guys from before I went to Germany. They just stayed with Emi, and I didn't have any problem with them, right? But then someone went on their website, and you know, in, in, they had like a contact form on their website like name and email and then write a message, right? And someone put a message on their website as if they were me, saying like, hey. you know, oh, your Wing Chun is not real or your Wing Chun sucks. And like, dude, anyone, hey. anyone who knows me knows that that's the last thing I would do, especially, 
Well, I mean, at any time, but especially at that time, the only thing I cared about was building my school. The last thing I want to do is, you know, pour gasoline and light a match and start a fight with, with these guys who are teaching over there. Like, this doesn't make any sense, right? And then, like, that instructor, his name was Milan, he contacted me. And he's like, hey, what is this or whatever? And I'm like, dude, you know me. Does this even sound like me? And he's uh -huh. like, oh, no, you're right. You know, and then that beef kind of got squashed and then Milan left and then some other guy took over and that guy was very concerned with what was going on in my school and, and sometimes, uh, you know, he's always like writing stuff in his blogs about like, you know, the difference between his Wing Chun and the other guys or whatever and um, I never paid any attention to it because they were teaching at a dance studio and I had an actual school. So as okay. far as I was concerned, they were just talking about me because I had something going on and they were still teaching five students in a dance studio, right? Mm -hmm. And that had nothing to do with Sifu Amin. That was just like his guy over here seemingly irritated at my uh, existence, right? But it's like they spend a lot of time thinking about me and I'm spending time thinking about them. And then uh, one or two of our students, because we had a lot of students, you know, we were building up a big base. You know, occasionally one or two students might leave. I had one or two students go and start training with them, mm -hmm. mainly because their Brook they had a branch in Brooklyn at that time was closer, yeah. right? But for them, it was like this yeah. huge moral victory. Convenience, and, the, yeah. and then they put their photos on the website, like, look at these students that we have gotten from, you know, City oh. Wing Chun or whatever. Oh, I trained at another WT school and oh. like, I wasn't satisfied and now I trained over here, right? But th what they didn't realize, like, we had tons of their students who had left them who were training here. Mm -hmm. And we had tons of people who did an intro lesson there, didn't like it, came here, liked it, and joined. And the last thing I would do would be parade all of those students on my website to be like, yeah, I went to that school in Brooklyn and didn't yeah. like it. And, and it, oh, it, it was no. like a little weird. It was like, dude, dude, calm down. In fact, there was one point where it got so annoying in our office, we used to have like the Ebmas School uh, Student of the Month because they kept joining our school, <laughs> all right? And, 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 and I, I never posted this online. And they were like constantly, they would get one or two people that trained here for a little bit and then it was like this huge moral victory and then you realize because they didn't have that many students. Man. You know, when you have five, 10 students and you get one, it's, it's a huge jump in your enrollment, in your overall. Mm -hmm. We have one or two students come or go here. It, it's, not, it's not making or breaking anything, right? And so I found that that was really weird, but that was the local guy that was not Sifu Imin. Mm -hmm. All right, Sifu Imin, I never had any problems with him, right? And then on our side, to be fair, so I, I put you know, some of his guys a little bit on blast just now, but on our side, yeah. The association was so concerned with what Sifu Amin was doing all the time. You know, if he, if he was in Inside, he had a, a cover article in Inside Kung Fu where he wrote a lot of bad things about like Lung Ting and stuff like that. And they were so upset about this mm -hmm. and wanted to react and write a counter statement or whatever. I'm like, who cares? All right. Just like, you know, uh, just, just like the old saying, it's like, you know, today's news is wrapping fish tomorrow. You're using that newspaper to wrap fish tomorrow, right? <laughs> okay. And like they would make these things like a really big deal when they were not a big deal at all, right? And, uh, you know, they were always concerned with what Sibu Imin was writing online or what he had put in, in on this interview or whatever. And then they always like wanted to ask me like, hey, you should write a statement about this. And I'm like, you know, uh, the, the head of the association of the chief instructor at that time, not, not uh, Leung Tang, although probably he was getting orders from Sifu Leung Tang, but the guy who was like the head instructor here in the US, he was constantly asking me to write stuff online and to do statements against Emin or whatever. And I'm like, why? Yeah. Well, how is this going to help us build our association? How is this going to help us build? How, what does this have to do with what we're doing with the students on the training floor? Mm. You know, and they were so obsessed because you realize like they had they had jealousy issues with him because he was kind of a big star and he did his own thing. But it's like you, you, they keep looking in the rearview mirror, right? And I, it was just one of those things that started to grind on me after a while. It's like I, uh, with absolutely all due respect to Sifu Imin, mm -hmm. once I started my own school. I didn't care what he was doing yeah, because he was not my instructor and he's not the guy who's running the association that I'm in. And they kept trying to like bring it back. And I kept like, and it was just like, dude, come on, get, get over it. Right. And you also, I'm sorry, That's you look draining. like, you look like a bitch when you're constantly complaining about an ex. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. I mean, like, look, if you, if your boy broke up with some girl five years ago, Oh no. And he brings Still. her up every conversation. Still. Okay. 
You you understand it, bro. You understand when they just broke up last week. Okay. Your boy's going through some He's stuff. He's going through it. Every time you go out to you get go something to it. eat, you're gonna have some conversations yeah. about his ex and yeah. how lousy she was or what what she yeah. did to you, right? But after five years, Damn. your boy's still talking about the ex every time. It's like the topic of conversation. And then after ten years, Whew. after a while. It's not the ex that's the problem. It's your boy that has a problem. All right? And I started to feel that the association was turning into your boy who's still talking about the ex 10 years later, right? And it's like, yo, bro, bro, move on. Get over it. All right? But all all in all, Sivu Amin was an absolute banger, man. And I, I saw him do some pretty amazing stuff and he's very powerful and he's built like a brick shit house. What's the most amazing thing you've seen him do firsthand? Like I, I saw him punch someone in Berlin through a kick shield. All right. Uh, because <laughs> someone, someone wanted to, someone, someone wanted to like uh, feel, uh, have a demonstration of like the Wing Chun step and punch, like oh, how okay. powerful it was. <laughs> and uh, they, the, they had a kick shield there, like a pretty thick kick shield, <laughs> right? Thick. It's like and, um, a foot thick. Yeah. And I remember he just, he just, did an arrow step and single punch. Oh. And he hit this guy so hard. <laughs> like, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate it. Because uh-huh. had I not seen it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it, right? Okay. But, like, the guy's standing, like, my, my cell phone case here. And I apologize for those of you listening to us on audio. But yeah. right now, I am holding a cell phone case okay. vertically. Vertically. And Vertical hold. Sivuebi just stepped in and punched <laughs> this guy right in the chest through the kick shield. Uh-huh. And the guy didn't go back flying like, you know, 10 feet. Uh-huh. The guy went like this. His feet went up in the air and he went horizontal and he just slammed on the ground. Oish. Like on the wow. side of his hip. And I was like, oh. And I remember when I saw that, I had a, another one of my uh, friends at that time was a, 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 a Turkish guy. And we just like turned and looked at each other. We we're like, whoa. Then he like, froze in the air too. <laughs> no, it was just, I mean, of course, boom. look, our, our recollection of yeah. events that we've seen is not always very accurate. It's possible over time. It's, but I, I, I'm pretty sure I remember what wow. I saw. Slow motion. And he just like, and he just slammed on the ground. And that was very impressive. That was super <laughs> impressive. And, um, you know, people might not be a huge fan of WT or Sifu Amin or whatever, but he's definitely earned the right... He's definitely carved himself as one of like, you know, one of the guys who has definitely helped to bring the style forward and mm-hmm. one of the guys who kind of was willing to show that the style was effective and, and could really do it. Mm, cool. So there you go. What the, the, our boy from Cuba oh, has yeah. a second question. This is, this is a two-parter. Hey, Kung Fu Genius listeners. If you're a Wing Chun practitioner, especially from the WT or Learning Ting line, and want to get really personalized immersion training with me, you can now apply to do an immersion course with me here in NYC, or if you like the sun, in my Florida home near Orlando. These courses are for instructors or anyone who's serious about learning the art in detail and working hard. I teach in program blocks like Siunam Tao, Cham Q, BUG, Wooden Dummy, and those include the Chi Sao Theory, Fighting Applications, and Training Methods as well. If you're really serious about learning Wing Chun, check out the link in the description below to find out about applying for a spot. For those of you who are not quite ready to do full private immersion training, you can also apply for a spot at either our winter or summer intensive training camps. We have a few spots available for non-city Wing Chun students, so apply today. A link for those options are in the description below. And now back to me. We love those two parters, right, Mikey? Do we? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, no. I love when people say that. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, no. The problem is that I'm following your advice on wall bag work. Uh-oh. And heavy bag work. Uh-oh. Which you talked about Uh-oh. in one of your podcasts. All my fault. But a few days ago, I've been having a little pain in my hands, wrists, and knuckles. And I wanted to know if that pain is normal or a bad application of training. I have friends who train boxing at the National Academy, and they told me that when they finish training, they put their hands in very cold water or ice. I would like to know your opinion on it. Because what has been observed in some Wing Chun schools is that they use medicine in their hands after training or exercising the iron fist. 
All right, there we go. All right, okay. so he's not done. Oh, no. you spent okay. a lot of time in the German castle and now in Hong Kong. Perhaps in one place, as it, as in the other, they had a solution for those pains. Okay, I can take this one. Oh, no, I can't. No, I can't. No, I can't. No, I can't. <laughs> Calm down. He's still in mourning from I the queen. Mikey does that. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Look at how he's laid out he's there. Still he's in just, the morning. He's so yeah. distraught. Yeah. yeah. For those who, uh, obviously, people cannot see Mikey Dean because he's off camera. He's basically lying sideways on his hip <laughs> with a, a bunch of tissues next to him because oh. he's still crying because yeah. of the death of the Tissue queen. box. No, 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 no. Well, he's still my... mourning over Princess Margaret. And that happened Princess... back in 2002 or something, right? Wow. Wow. Deep cut reference right there. <laughs> wow. To the... To the, um, to the royal family there, you know what I mean? He can still be mourning about Princess Di. Anyway. That was so, 98, I think. I 97. Was it was 97. <laughs> my bad, my bad. My yeah, bad. you know, apropos, I was in Cuba when that happened. Oh. That's how I know it was 97. Ooh. That was the last time I was in Cuba. You yeah. and Mar- Marajev or Chavez. That's right. Yeah, um, that prevented Mickey me from getting him. laid. Hey, that's a story for another podcast. I not love another getting episode. laid by the Samoans. All right. So... They throw that lay on you. What? That, that's in Hawaii. Yeah. Those are not Samoans. Oh, my busy. Jesus. My busy. Shout out. <laughs> He's such a... He's shout out to what? He doesn't even know who to shout out to. Right? <laughs> shout out. Terrible. Yeah, who's shout out? All right. So anyway. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So um, basically, I'm being put on blast for my uh, wall bag and heavy bag advice causing mm-hmm. wrist and knuckle yeah, problems. Yeah. Why you, why, you, why you be doing that? Uh, so... Um, Misleading. So... so uh, Mr. Chavez here, he's, he's uh, contacted me on Facebook. He's in Cuba, right? So I mm-hmm. don't know how, how much access he has to like seeing all this stuff online regularly because the internet is a little, it's expensive and it's hard to get um, in Cuba. So I know that he does follow me. So he'll ask me some stuff on, on Facebook or whatever. And unfortunately, I, I, I don't really have that much time um, to answer stuff. I get, nowadays I get inundated with, since the podcast, mm-hmm. I get inundated with, um, friend requests on my personal accounts. Uh, and everyone just decides they want to just ask me like all sorts of advice. Right. And right. it's like, well, I mean, I, I, I don't have time to like sp- give a thorough answer. And I go, but you know that I have this podcast and you can put it in the comments and I'll answer it on the podcast. Right. So, um, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to be rude when people contact me, but like, you know, I don't have time in the middle of my day to write a dissertation on wall bag training because I'm doing, yeah, I'm teaching, I'm doing all, I'm doing stuff like this. I'm you looking at you and stuff like this, that. Man. Yeah, this is me making time for those questions. Okay, this is where I answer so them. All right, come on. Um, come and, on. And so, you know, he asked me a little bit about using the wall bag and stuff, but it's not easy to teach someone this stuff through through text. Uh, that's why I much prefer, you know. Um, teaching people on hand. It's also the reason why I do a podcast. We can have discussions about this kind of stuff because I don't feel that teaching through the medium of YouTube is really that effective. It's also a very thankless thing to do anyway. Mm -hmm. So there's some people who go, how come you're not, how come you're talking about sparring and you're not showing it? And I'm like, you you read the title of this channel is called the Kung Fu Genius podcast. (laughs) Do you know what a podcast is? Like it's uh, some guy was like, how come you're not making your sparring public? Uh, Uh, Because I do it here at my school is what I do for a living. What are you talking about? This is a podcast. Yeah. Ignoranus. So So, for the only fans. Yeah. Yeah. So for the only fans, right? And you know, like I said, for the only fans, the joke, like the Joker said, all right, if you're good at something, don't do it for free. Don't do it. All right. Okay. So if you, if you want to see how to hit the ball bag, 1024 6th Avenue, yeah. fifth, you, you, you know, fifth floor. You can come here and book a lesson. Would you, would you do a only, only fans? Oh, I would. I would, need, yeah, do yes. a city. First KFG all, only fans. KFG right? only yes. fans. Well, so only uh, fans. I, I actually just made a slight update to our uh, Patreon page. So for Ooh. our Patreon supporters, because you can support, you know, it's going to sound like a, uh, like, 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 like another pitch, but this is actually something that's really good for our Patreon supporters. Our Patreon supporters always get first dibs on questions for the KFG podcast. Mm-hmm. But I realized the problem is we often, although not now, we're usually a number of weeks ahead of when the episode comes out. That means if you have a question, the episode that answers that question might not come out for two, three, four, sometimes six weeks. Okay. And so I realized that some people want, they want an answer immediate more quickly. All right? They want that immediate gratification, yeah. right? So now, um, you know, on, on Patreon, we have a bunch of different levels of support. It starts at five bucks a month. So f- with that, you get like the episode. The episodes come out on Monday. 
And if you're a Patreon, usually you get it Friday, Saturday at the latest, unless Andrew is on some hiking trip somewhere with, okay. No, okay. with, with no reception, and oh, it's right. Sunday, and I'm going, uh, Andrew, uh, you got that episode ready uh, yet? Because uh, no. it's yeah. coming out a day before. I, I, I try to get them on Friday. Like uh, the last episode for the Patreons actually got it Thursday because as soon as I get it, I put Ooh, it on there. So, that's um, lit. But you, you get it a few days earlier just for five bucks. And then for every kind of tier above that, you get different goodies. You can get like, um, like a 15-minute Zoom with me or you can get okay. your own private episode of the Kung Fu Genius, which you've done a couple. That's at the baller level of support. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and then those who I think like 25 and above a month, they get their name in the comments. You can actually see if you guys look at the description of not in the comments in the description of the video, you can see all of our fine supporters there. And, you know, we have also you have Sifu David Peterson is a supporter of the KMG Lit. podcast, which is amazing. Right. So and um, we appreciate all of the, Thank uh, you. All those Shout supporters. Out. Shout out. Yeah. So now what I decided to do is if my Patreon supporters have a question. I pinned a comment at the top. They can write it there. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to film a response just on my phone right then and there, a very thorough response, and just post it on Patreon just for the Patreons. Oh. And then we'll do it on the podcast, but the podcast version is of course gonna be the public version. So I'm gonna leave out some details, juicy stories, blah, blah, blah. But for the Patreons, I'll put all that shit in there. So, so they'll get like the immediate answer, which I, um, I won't hold back. And then two, three, six, 14 weeks later, I'll answer the, the question on the podcast and I'll be all PC and, uh, you know, and I'll delete lots of details out of it, right? So that's something we're doing for them. And then also now, do you know that Instagram now has subscriptions? So I just I just set this what? up. You can you can make uh, you can make video. You can post videos on your Instagram, mm -hmm. but the only people who can see them are people who subscribe, and it starts at like four ninety nine. So basically five bucks. So it's the same as my Patreon thing, right? And I decided to do it just to try it out. I have one post. I don't have any yeah. subscribers yet because I don't think anyone knows I made that post. Oh no! Um, but you can subscribe to me on IG. Ooh. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put like uh, Wing Chun tips on there so that it's a little bit different. So it's something different from the podcast. Like once a week, maybe show a Chi Sao technique or mm. once a week, maybe show some defense or something like that. And then if you subscribe at five bucks a month, you can get it. And then I thought, well, my Patreon supporters are already supporting me on Patreon. And I don't want them to feel like, oh, now I'm for five bucks over here. They're going to you get something that the Patreons don't get. So now when I make a subscriber video for Instagram, I'll just throw that oh. for my Patreon guys as well. So they get it, too. So if you're a Patreon supporter, you get everything. But if you just want like a weekly tip on techniques or something like that, or then for five bucks a month, you can do that on IG. OK, so and, and then that is, and, and also on IG, if I get a lot of questions about something, then I might. I might answer those kind of questions on IG for the subscribers. So for those cool. people who want answers quickly, mm -hmm. all right, um, you got to pay for it. You're okay, pretty, so pretty popping on the IG too. Yeah, pretty popping on the IG. Pretty popping. So in the future, we'll consolidate onto the OnlyFans, so like we agree. Yeah, and then it'll be yeah. yeah. And yeah. then if you support me on OnlyFans, you get everything. I tell you, yeah, absolutely. Um, I tell you who had a great OnlyFans, right? Who? The Queen. Oh Jesus. <laughs> Oh, okay, so anyway, so now uh, back to the wall bag question. All right, so anytime you are, anytime you're striking something, mm -hmm. okay, uh, especially if you're new at it, uh, and especially when you're striking something that's a little bit more solid, like a wall bag compared to um, a spongy something kick shield or something okay. like that, right? Then you have to, to take into consideration that your joints, uh, your tendons, and your bones need to get acclimated to the fact that you're going to do something repetitive and percussive. Yeah, a little bit of trauma going uh, yeah, on. Yeah, you're basically inflicting low-level trauma. You are creating little mini injuries, mm -hmm. okay? So how do we do this? Slowly, all right? Mm -hmm. But everyone, uh, you know, everyone can chain punch like a maniac in the air, and then the assumption is they're going to chain punch like a maniac when they go to the wall bag. And the wall bag is a training tool that you practice with. So what I want people to do is reframe the way you look at the wall bag. Some people look at the wall bag and they think like, oh, I want to punch it super fast, super hard for a super long time. I want to kill it. And you should look at the wall bag as a practice tool. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, you know, tr just train my chain punches or train my punch on the wall bag. I'm going to practice my punches on the wall bag. 
And that is a different way of framing it. Mm -hmm. Because then it's not just like, oh, I got to go like, everyone wants to know how many punches do I do on the wall bag? You know, do I do a thousand? Because in Hong Kong, they would say you got to do a thousand punches, right? Or do you do them all the way through? Do you do them in sets of a hundred? Do you do them in sets of 50? How do you do it? And I think I can give you answers for that. But I think that that actually defeats the purpose because that's when you're training your punch. When you, however, if you want to train something, you need to practice it first, okay? You don't want to train something that you have not practiced. Okay. Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of reps in something incorrectly. You know what I mean? You're gonna now, now you're gonna get your thousand punches in there, but a thousand uh, doing the punches wrong, all mm -hmm. right? Whereas when you start with the wall bag, you should just, you know, punch a little more slowly and work on the timing, trying to get the joints to land at the same time and to stabilize as you hit the wall bag. Paying attention to landing with the bottom three knuckles. You don't want to curl the wrist up and then end up hitting with this one here. You want Ooh. that stabilization to happen at the moment of impact. If you're really tense, you're going to get tired and you're going to hold a lot of the force in the arms. If you're too loose, your hand is not going to have structure when you hit the wall bag. So you have to find this Goldilocks zone. Not mm -hmm. too hot, not too cold, just right. And listen for that and, pop. Yeah, and listen for that pop. And you're not gonna get that just by walking up to the wall bag going, thousand punches, <laughs> oh, I'm tired, my hands hurt and everything hurts. Oh, and then wow. now you can't do it for two, three weeks, all right? Do 50 punches on the wall bag, but do 50 concentrated, focused punches where you're like, you're paying attention to your shoulder position, your elbow, how the force goes into the wall, the timing of the wrist. These are things that you can better pick up if you do it, if you just slow down a little bit. Mm -hmm. You become more, to use a common buzzword nowadays, you become more mindful. You know, think about, okay, your stance, how you're standing, breathing, relaxing, how you're launching it, and practice with the wall bag playfully. Not go up to and go like, oh, I have to do my ceremonial thousand punches per day because some internet person or some Wing Chun book told me that uh, Wing Chun people have to start 300 punches a day and then you go to 400 until you do a thousand and you do that for three years and then you never do it again. There, there's some weird wall bag advice in traditional Wing Chun, wow. like, I mean, tr classical Wing Chun, I should say, where like, oh, you only need to train the wall bag for three years because if you train the wall bag beyond that, you're going to like completely shatter yourself and you go like, just a boxer's arms are breaking in half for hitting heavy bags for 10, 15 Ouch. years. Yeah, no, it's just, it's weird pseudo-scientific advice. I mean, a lot of the old training advice that was doled out in Wing Chun, some of it was from trial and error and actual practice, and some of it is just uh, pseudo-scientific, superstitious nonsense. Horse Pass, shit. Pa horse shit. <laughs> Passed down and then never questioned because some somebody uh, that you called Sifu or Sigong told it to you, right? Okay. And so this this doesn't really make sense. Wall bag, I still train the wall bag regularly. So, and I've been doing it for more than three years, right? So, uh, but my, my wall bag training changes from, from practice. So sometimes I just, I just, sometimes I'll just go up to the wall bag and I'll just, just do little baby inch punches. Mm -hmm. And I'm just working on the timing, elbow, shoulder, relaxing, mm -hmm. feeling how that's going, trying to figure out how late can I wait before I need to stabilize? Because if you stabilize too soon, you start to hold the power in the arm. If you stabilize too late, your hand turns into sauerkraut when you punch the bag. So you have, to, you have to kind of find that Goldilocks zone, mm -hmm. right? And you find that through normal practice or, or easy step-by-step -step practice or playful practice, mindful practice. And then what you'll notice after a while is as you do this kind of very playful practice where you maybe do 50 punches, 100 punches, but it's mindful practice focused efforts. Okay. Over time, that punch gets a little stronger, the timing gets a little better, and your hand will slowly acclimate to hitting that harder target. But you decide, I'm, I've never hit a wall bag before, I'm now gonna do my ceremonial, ritualistic 1,000 daily chain punches because somebody told me that's what I need to do. And you blast the piss out of your knuckles and your wrists and your elbows and everything. And now you can't do anything for two weeks. Mm. And that's not, that's not really smart, okay? So I would say when you start wall bag training, don't overdo it. Play with the wall bag a little bit in timing, go slow, build it up over time, and then start to do some sets 
mm -hmm. of punches and then build it up. But you don't have to do a thousand punches every day. Okay. And you don't, ha in, but you know, but do more than a few every now and again, right? You don't have to hit the wall bag every day, but you should hit the wall bag a couple times a week at least. And then depending on your level of interest, you hit it more or you hit it less. Casual student just comes twice a week, does Wing Chun for fun, not super serious. Hit the wall bag a little bit before class and a little bit after class. And okay. if you come twice a week, you're good. And if you're more serious, hit it more. And then hit heavy bag and hit other things as well. So it, it, the problem is there's no, uh, it's no cookie cutter answer, all right? But if you are, if your hands are hurting, mm -hmm. your wrists are hurting, you, you're doing it too much, all right? Now there could be a mistake in your technique if, you're, if your joints are hurting and everything is hurting. But it could also be that you're just overdoing it and you need to spend a little bit more time doing slower practice to get the timing. The Wing Chun punch is not like this, this stiff, solid object that goes into a wall bag. It is, it's, like, it's, like a, it's like a whip and you want to take, make use of your joints and you want to not push the punch. You want to throw the punch into the wall bag. Right. So that takes time. You're not going to do that just by going up to it and going like this and then exhausting yourself, right? So... My advice would be take it a little easier, build it up step by step. What his boxing friends do by putting their hands in ice and cold water. Yeah, I mean, that's great. But the thing is, I don't think you should be training the wall bag every single time to the point where you really need to do that. True. Wow. You know what I mean? Like, look, a boxer is going to be hitting mitts and hitting a heavy bag for all of his training that he's not sparring with someone else. Mm -hmm. That means that for most of the training, he's hitting someone. Whereas in Wing Chun, we use controlled force with a partner. And when do we really hit something? When we do the wall bag or when we do the heavy bag. When we do Chi Sao, we use controlled power. When we train techniques, we're more concerned with not getting hit than, you know, we're not hitting our partner full power in the face, Ouch. right? So that means most, cool. of, most of the hitting training comes from the wall bag or maybe the heavy bag or maybe some focus mitts. So it's a slightly, it's a lower percentage than what the boxer does. But I, I would think that maybe when you're a beginner, you might need some of that. But if you have to like constantly ice your hands after training, uh, you, need to, you need to pump your brakes, son. You're, go, <laughs> you're, going a little, you're going a little too hard. It should be done, it should be an organic thing. The bones... Uh, will adjust over time, tendons, ligaments, strength, that stuff will adjust over time. Don't try to force it. Okay. Of course, he also mentions things like Dita Jiao or whatever, and we've talked about that in previous episodes. That stuff can be helpful, but it's totally possible to have an amazing Wing Chun punch, well-conditioned hands that are free of dysfunction without having to use Dita Jiao. I mean, you just, you just be sensible, all right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so that would be uh, that would be my advice. Are there any uh, cool forms for like punching? Punching forms. You mean the kunto, <laughs> this thing that was made up in Saarland, Germany? No, there's no. Not. Next question. <laughs> Thanks. You're right. Next up, we got Andrew Lin. Andrew Lin, I've heard of this guy. Yeah, he's, we love this guy. Yeah, yeah we love this guy. He's a he's a, he's a uh, regular. Yes. All right. You could say that. Bruce Lee. Uh -oh. Once talked about how, unless there's a human with three arms and legs, all humans are the same. And so there is a universal truth in martial arts, given this. Why have martial arts evolved so much? Mm. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Bruce said this line in, uh, in the Pierre Burton interview, but yeah. he's also said it before, you know, and... Um, you know, the idea was that unless human beings have three arms and three legs, mm -hmm. uh, we essentially will continue to fight the way we fight. You know, we have two hands and two legs, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is how do you maximize your tools? All right. And then, you know, talking about that being, you, you know, universal as opposed to like, you know, what is really different between the different styles? Well, they're maybe not as different as you think they are. All right. I mean, of course, your mileage may vary. It also depends on the instructor and all sorts of other things like that. But um, the universal truth, he literally says it right there. He says, you know, we have we have two hands and two legs, so we have to find the best way to use these tools. Mm -hmm. That's the universal truth. Mm. That's why it evolves, because we're still trying to find the best way to use these tools. Man. And even if you learn, let's say, a very streamlined style, whether it's Wing Chun or boxing or whatever your strike, let's say just striking for now, right? 
Well, it's still going to evolve. Not like you're going to develop new techniques, but by doing it more and more, you find better ways of executing the techniques you already know. So you're becoming more efficient. You're becoming more streamlined. Um, you find better ways to apply it against an opponent in different situations. And you also problem solve because what happens when you get really, really good at something? Mm -hmm. Your opponent gets good at defending it or gets better at defending it. All right. Which now means you're going to have to launch that tool, like if we're just talking about striking for now, in a way that's going to now circumnavigate the way the guy's starting to defend it. All right. So it's like as there, as there is an upgrade in the way techniques are done, well, then there also has to be an upgrade in the way that they're defended, which means that okay. then there's going to be a change in the way those things are countered. Okay. So that is the constant process of, um, you know, of, of how martial arts develop, even if we're not talking about developing new techniques wholesale. We're talking about improving the way things are done, right? Like in the 70s, okay, uh, in Chisao, um, in you know, it was very common uh, when people were doing Punsao to kind of grab under your arm, and then do a lapsau back fist, right? And you know, for the for the longest time, that was like a gold standard Wing Chun technique. All right. You do Pun Sao, and then you slip your foot out underneath your bong, grab and do a back fist, right? And like that was like people, you know, trained that and they were really good and really fast. And to a certain degree, everyone's trying to imitate Bruce Lee or whatever. Well, I mean, now it's 2022. This is if anyone does that stuff still nowadays, they're like a dinosaur, okay? <laughs> because like, first of all, you're doing punzo and then you grab underneath and you do a lapsau back fist or whatever. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are five ways they're to like counter stegosaurus. this. Yeah, there are like five ways to counter this without even trying, okay. okay? Without relying on speed of bringing your other hand up, which was normally the problem. Like, look, you got really good at doing this one here and then your partner has to get faster at bringing their hand up to defend it, all right? So what happens when they defend it? Well, then you have to do the next thing, right? Mm. So then that becomes a problem for the person who's defending because if the guy does the back fist, they put their hand up to defend and now that hand gets lopped and then they bring the other one, oh, that one gets lopped. So what does that mean? You cannot defend it by just lifting your hand up as a Wu Sao or a Tan Sao. You're just basically, that's just fodder for the other guy to lap, pack or do whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So now we have to, raise the way these things are taught. And if we follow the Wing Chun principles, you realize, first of all, grabbing underneath your bong sao and doing a lap sao back fist is a dumb attack, all right? <gasps> but um, even dumber is if you get hit with it because it's basic, it's, oh. it's super basic. Damn. But in the 70s, that was like some rock star shit, yeah. you know, doing poon sao, whoosh, and you do that lap sao back fist, oh, right? Yeah. Like this, right? Oiled up gotcha. with, your, with your Bruce Lee muscles and <laughs> your nunchucks in your back pocket, right? <laughs> oh, uh, no. But nowadays, if you do something, I mean, this is basic, oh, right? Which no. is why I just find it kind of funny when Wing Chun people still do stuff like that. And I'm like, this is, this is old stuff, man. Yeah. This is like super, super basic. Like the, no, no one... No one looks at that as being like a gold standard of anything unless you're teaching yourself Wing Chun from YouTube, or whatever, right? So the universal truth, in my opinion, is maximizing the way the human body is used in, in combat because mm -hmm. it's not about, you cannot physically create techniques that would require a different anatomy. You have the anatomy you have. So it's about streamlining and finding the better way to do everything that you're doing and the way to make it more adaptable, more powerful, and um, more relevant to the way styles are changing. That, for me, is the universal truth, not techniques, right? It's like the, um, the mediocre minds in martial arts discuss mm. techniques. Okay. Okay. And the, 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 the superior guys are discussing principles, concepts, ideas, the threads that make things work. Mm. The guy that really doesn't understand martial arts is futzing about elbow position, is futzing mm. about the exact mm. position of the hand or the knuckle or something like that, right? That's like, that's low, lower level conversation about martial arts. Higher level conversation is what, what's the, the concept that's making this thing work? What is, the, what is the principle here that is allowing this person to overcome that person, all right? And the lower mind's like, oh, this elbow's in the wrong position, or whatever. It's like... Um, that could be a technical deficiency in that moment, but that's probably not the overriding issue that's, that's making this guy lose compared to that guy. Mm. Uh, you can definitely wow. hear it's, it's a Saturday morning in New York. It's some New York shit. All right. Oh, should, should we wait for that to go by? Why? They're coming for you. They're coming for you, right? They the Wing Chun, the Wing Chun, the Wing Chun, po the Wing Chun police are going to issue me a ticket for saying the under laps out back fist is dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The Wing Chun police is All right. here.
I've got to pull up Andrew on one thing. I think. Yeah. Well, maybe it's a Bruce Lee quote saying that all, as humans, we're all the same. Mm-hmm. It's like, wow, there's one human that wasn't the same. The queen. She was better than us. She, she was way blood. better. The queen was better than she us. She was better. Yeah. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Yes. 100%, I believe that. Way better. Okay, next question. <laughs> next up, we try. We're going to offend some of our fans that are real hardcore <laughs> royal fans. Oh, dear. Hey, Kung Fu Genius listeners. Are you a fan of Wing Chun Kung Fu? Well, if you listen to me, I assume you are. I got great news for KFG fans. Right now, you can get an all-access, one-month free trial subscription to Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine. Yes, I said free. Go to wcinewsstand.com and register in the upper right-hand corner. Fill out your email and password and use the code KFGTRIAL to get your free trial to all the issues from 2011 to the current issue. That's right, all the issues. Even the one with this cool guy on the cover. That's me for those of you listening to us on audio. My Kung Fu Genius column is also in all the new issues as if you needed another reason to get this awesome magazine. Go get your free trial subscription today. For all that information, check out the description below. And now back to me. Jason Peck. All right. The KFG Live at City Wing Chun was a good episode. It was fun. I like that one. Wow, that was a good one. It was. Yeah, yeah. We, had, we had a whole live studio audience. We did. We did. They were, they were just like chimed in. Yeah. Man, that was dope. Yeah, it was dope. Yeah. We should do that again. Yeah. ASAP. Yeah, we need a different theme tune, though. For, so, you know, you know, the KFG is filmed before a live studio audience with some canned laughter and all that. Yeah, kind of just stuff. like Three's Company. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Shout out to uh, Jack Tripper. All right, let's go. <laughs> Woo-wee. Chrissy Snow. All right. I have two questions. Mm-hmm. The second one is some hot nonsense. Okay. So he's prepping us in advance. Yes. Okay. If a fight in a street situation is unavoidable, how do you, as a WT instructor, end it? That is oh, that's the first, the first question. question. Okay, so we'll wait for the hot nonsense question. Right. <laughs> um, well, I mean, this is a uh, specific question. WT instructor. This is a specific question that requires a general answer mm. or a general, answer, a general question <laughs> that needs a specific answer. Oh, man. Um, no, I mean, look, these things, how, how do you answer that? Who's standing in front of you? Mm. What, what is your frame of mind? What do you have in your hand? What are you wearing? Where, Where are, are you? you? In, in New York, that's yeah. always a question. Where, Where are, are you? you? <laughs> right? If somebody attacks you in the middle of Times Square, yeah. you're a little bit less freaked out uh-huh. than if you're somewhere like, you know. On in, the edge in, of the subway platform. On the edge of the yeah. subway platform or you're between two, two buildings somewhere in Brooklyn, between right? Between okay. two dummies. Yeah, between two <laughs> dummies, right? Uh, that, that, that's always going to change it, right? So, I mean, mm. for a New Yorker... It's, oh, it's very environmental. In it's environmental, right? Where oh. are you when you get attacked, right? right. Um, so, I mean, you, you, can't, you, you can't answer that question. And also the problem is that if I were to postulate, this is what I would do as a WT instructor if I'm attacked on the street, okay? That in no way means that that is exactly what I would do if I were actually in that situation. Because when you're in that situation and people want to cause you physical harm... You have adrenaline surging through you, mm-hmm. and now suddenly it, it's, a, it's a very different animal. You're not there sitting in your comfortable podcast setup discussing what you would hypothetically do if someone wanted to murder your face with their fist. Right. All right. Okay. Or they had a weapon, or there was more of them, right? Mm. So people always want these like specific answers to these general questions. And it's it's too multifactorial, and that's not a cop-out. I think most people who say anything technically, well, if I was surrounded by that, I would do, I'd kick this guy, punch this guy, and do that, are, are fantasists who don't know that situation. Mm-hmm. Because if you're in a situation, let's just say, where you're in, not in the proverbial alley, but let's say you're in Chinatown in Manhattan, okay? Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you can, be, you can be between, you're not on, we're not talking about being on Canal or, or Mulberry. We're talking about, like, you're on, you're on those streets. little side streets, Okay, so not like (laughs) not like the, you know, not like the superhero back alley kind of thing, but you're like in kind of a small street and you walk by it's it's late and it's dark and someone just comes out and grabs you. Okay, Um, I think most New Yorkers, even if they have some fighting skill, would ultimately try to fight that guy off while getting out of there, because you always know in the back of your mind, there's more coming. Mm hmm. 
You know what I mean? Like if, if you were to fight one person with the idea that the, the no one else is it's coming, just someone else, I and mean, then suddenly his boys come himself. out because yeah. he's having a hard time. You, you you all like I don't know. As a New Yorker, I I never assume one person is going to come yeah. at me, and that doesn't mean that like I train multiple attacker scenarios. Yeah. That means that I avoid the piss this out of an anything instinct. that could escalate. Yeah. It's an instinct, right? And if you're a New Yorker, as you know, you don't need to t you don't need to be taught this. Mm -hmm. It's like it, 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 they implant it in your in in your DNA once you've been here for a year and a half. So yeah. even if you come from somewhere else, you've been in New York for a year and a half. You got that. You got yeah. that in there. No, be, before every fight I've gotten into, I wonder uh, who's his boys. Who's his boys that it's might always, come after his me? Boys, at right? Because yeah. you always think if this dude is randomly attacking me, it's, yeah. it's probably part of an initiation. Or later, or a week from right? now, he might have and, come at me. And yeah. I start cracking this guy. If he has problems, his yeah. boys are going to come out. Yeah. It's like no, you yeah. you would literally try to get the hell out of there, no matter what you did. You would try to fight while escaping. You mm -hmm. wouldn't just stand there and be like, all right, whatever, right? Because your motivations for self-defense change depending on the situation. If, you, um, if you're confronted with someone and it's verbal, you, you, know, you use verbal de-escalation to kind of try to stop this thing. And when that doesn't go anywhere, you have to be absolutely consequent with your action to do something, hopefully with a little bit of surprise on your side after you told the guy three times to, you know, leave me alone. I don't want any trouble. Back up, please. Look, mm -hmm. I don't want any trouble. And he keeps going, boom, you got to go and you got to do it, right? Yeah. Not go there and go, okay, let's go in a sparring match, which like people fantasize like, okay, let's go back and forth. I'm going to use my jab and test the distance, see how he reacts. Mm -hmm. If, he, if I can bait him on the feints and I'm going to kick low and then give him this and then shoot in, like, you don't have time for that in a self-defense situation. We're not talking about you, have the, you can go long game on him over 10 rounds, you know, beat him to the body to lower his guard. I mean, uh -huh. this is like you got to go, all right? You're right. either going to get out of there. You're going to try to de-escalate the situation. If the de-escalation doesn't work, you're going to defend yourself. And that's if the guy starts by talking shit to you. So that means that that would be a form of social violence. You know, the, the, the monkey dance between men and ego escalation. But if someone just grabs you, that's not social violence. Now we're talking about predatory violence. Mm. And when predators, so, so things like, what, what are we talking about? Somebody just like getting in your face, someone wants money and then gets aggressive when you don't give them money. You're still, you're still in a somewhat social setting where you can use your words, de-escalate, continue, keep space. Right? Or are we talking about someone who just comes out and grabs you yeah. and tries to take you shit like what, happen, like what happened to me in 2008, right? That's oh, a totally yeah. different story. So you, you, so you don't go like with this perfect plan in your mind about like how you would de-escalate the situation only for someone to kind of run up behind you and push you and then try to kick you while you're on the ground and that situation mm -hmm. doesn't happen, right? Or you always plan in your mind that, you know, a ninja is going to jump out and attack you, right? And then the time you end up getting in a fight is a drunk guy who gets aggressive and the thing escalates and before mm -hmm. you know it, he suddenly takes a swing at you, right? So the thing is, what situation are we talking about? There's no monolithic idea of a street fight, mm -hmm. all right? Okay, if we're talking about self-defense, then we're not talking about street fighting, bro, all right? Street fighting assumes two willing participants, all right? And when you have two willing participants fighting on the street, bro, because only fight on the streets, man, no oh, rules, all right. all right? I got news for you, that's illegal, mm -hmm. all right? Because if you are not being forced to defend yourself physically, then you are opting to do it. And that's illegal, that's fighting. Fighting is illegal. Okay, whether it's on the street, where I'm from, you, you know, or, or or you know, in your in your backyard or whatever, right? Okay. So you you have to you, we have to understand like what what is street fighting? I don't understand that, right? Self defense means there's only one willing participant. That's the guy who's assaulting you. You yeah. are an unwilling participant. All right, yeah. that's a different equation right there, and that changes everything because. This is now about a power dynamic between two people as opposed to a contest just to see who's better. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, you cannot you, you can have an idea of how you would handle these things, you know, uh, uh, trying to de-escalate these things and trying to uh, uh, avoid the fight. And then if you can't, boom, you got to do something. Or if the guy just straight up attacks you, you have to make sure you have to hope that you're well trained in dealing with the, the, these different kind of attacks that are going to come. But you cannot say what you would do. And also in his question, he said, what would I do as a WT instructor? This okay? is the question. But right? here's the thing. If I'm assaulted on the street or attacked or accosted, I'm not a WT instructor. Okay. I'm Alex Richter. Yeah. Everyone is just themselves in uh. that situation. All right. Your training 
may leave you better prepared for some situations than others, or your training might also have a huge blind spot that you, that, that you might not be prepared for, right? But ultimately, it's just you and the other person or person standing there. So it's about mm -hmm. how quickly can you get this thing between your ears working to come up with a solution. And that ex far exceeds simply what you learned on the martial arts training floor, all right? Wow. I mean, look, just a few weeks ago, there's a world champion Brazilian jiu-jitsu um, uh, instructor um, in Brazil. I think his name was Leandro. I forgot his last name, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. That might be his last name. Um, he got into it with someone at a uh, restaurant. Okay? And, okay. Uh, you know, there was like words. I don't know what happened or whatever. And then the guy, you know, took a swing at the Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy. And the Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy took him to the ground, held him down. And he's like, are we done? Are we done? And the guy's like, oh, I, I give up. And then he let him go. And that guy shot the Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructor in the head. And he's dead. World champion. Okay? Ouch. So, so the thing is, so it doesn't matter the style. Oh, man. Right? When you're in a, when you're in a self-defense situation, when you're in a street fighting situation, yeah. it's not your style against whatever. It's you. Mm. It's you. How well are you prepared? All right, the martial arts we practice, these things enhance our lives, these are things we like to do, whether it's for physical exercise or culturally we find it interesting or we like the techniques or it's something that we feel good doing, right? Um, but if someone attacks you on the street, you are not a Wing Chun Sifu, you are not a karate practitioner, you're not a Jiu Jitsu blue belt, you're not a ninjutsu grandmaster, you are just you, mm -hmm. okay? That's all you got, Yeah. all right? And whether or not you can come out of that situation or not, is more about what's between your ears than about what the, the shape of the punch that you learned for the last 10 years, all right? Yeah. And that's the, that's the calculus of a self-defense situation, all right? So I, uh, I, I don't mean to, I'm not trying to not answer the question, but this is not a question that can be answered, yeah. all right? So uh, what's the nonsense question? Oh, before you started on your actual martial arts journey, did you ever teach yourself martial arts by watching movies? Maybe the eight drunken gods from the drunken master, or like I did, the opening of Snake and Eagle's Shadow. Uh huh. That's actually not a nonsense question. That's a pretty good question. I actually like it better than the first question. Also, shout out to the KFG team, the KFG Alex Richter, Mikey Dean, Andrew Lynn, Hector Martinez, Des Ryan. Kess the MC, and of course, Dreisen. <laughs> whoops, whoops, sorry. I mean, Dr. Eisen. I mean, whoops, I did it again. I meant Dre Eisen, obviously. Dude, this was a way better question than the first one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love this guy. Well formulated and well written. <laughs> I can take this one for you. Oh. He was a ninja. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, ninja no, because of um, starting martial arts... Uh, pretty much ran parallel to me starting to watch martial art movies. Yeah. So I didn't watch martial art movies for years and then begin martial arts. The first, first martial art movie I saw, as I've told the story many, many times, was Enter the Dragon. Uh -huh. um, no, actually, sorry, that's not true. The first martial arts movie I saw was Karate Kid. Okay. And that made me want to learn karate. And then three or four weeks later, I saw... Enter the dragon. Okay. And I was like, what? God. Okay, that's what I want to do, right? Got it. And then, but pretty much right on the heels of that, I started learning karate. So I didn't have this like gap between, like, you know, like where I was just watching. Well, I did start in martial arts when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't really look to movies to learn stuff so much, but I would definitely, I would imitate the stuff I saw in the movies, but not to do that stuff in class. I just wanted to like, if I saw No Retreat, No Surrender, yeah. you know, I like imitated like the stuff that he was learning from the fake Bruce Lee. Okay. And uh, I would try to do some of like Van Damme's kicks later on. And um, the, kung, uh, the Kung Fu movies, like Drunken Master and all that mm -hmm. stuff, I didn't really have access to that until I was older, when I was a teenager, when I lived in Seattle. Because growing up in in New Jersey, in Lincroft, New Jersey. You didn't have access to Kung Fu movies. We could only see them on Saturdays when you had Black Belt Theater. Hey. The one nice thing about living in that part of Jersey, which I took you to my old house uh -huh. just a few weeks ago, even though it's like very, it's very suburban, it's very out there, but it's close enough to New York. We didn't have our own um, TV stations. 
all of our TV stations were New York City TV stations. Yo. So even though I grew up, you saw where I grew up. It's, right. very, it's, it's New Jersey suburbia, oh. right? But all of our all, our news was all New York news because wow. there, there was no Central Jersey news team. It was a we. So I watched Ernie Anastas and all yeah. like the all the New York news That's anchors. I knew all that stuff, right? And we got we had sat we had Black Belt Theater on Saturdays, which showed the Kung Fu movies. So I grew wow. up on watching New York TV. Okay, right. So that's where I saw those movies. Yeah. That's where I saw those movies, but I didn't have a chance. Like, you couldn't get them on video. It was very difficult to get at that time. And mm. Chinatown was all the way in Manhattan. And Chinatown in the 80s was not a place you took your eight year old son. <laughs> all right. Uh, I, I got to bring in my student, Elliot Leung, and tell some. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Chinatown he stories. He grew up from in Chinatown. The no, he didn't. But he went to Chinatown during that time. Oh, and he told he told me this crazy story. Oh no, New York, New York Chinatown in the eighties. Oh, goodness. he was at a restaurant, a Chinese restaurant, and um, somebody came in. This is in the eighties, so it's wild times. Yeah. Pre Giuliani, it's wild shit, right? Wild, wild west. Type Someone thing. came in with a gun and robbed. It was like a dim sum place, <laughs> and just pulled a gun at like the old Chinese lady. Yeah. Uh, and asks for like all the money, right? And she, you know, opens the cash, she gives this guy all the money, right? He puts uh -huh. it in a bag and he starts running out. And the moment he walks out, she grabs a gun from underneath oh. and she walks out onto the street and he's running. And she, he said he just saw her on the street, kind of like aiming and shoots. First shot misses, hits the ground, second shot misses. <laughs> like, but it was like some ch old Chinese lady. It's like wow. so the guy went, and she just starts shooting back, right? And like so, that was that was Chinatown back him? then, right? I, I don't, I, yeah. I have, it, it's been yeah. a long time since he told me this story. Wow. I don't, I don't want to like misquote it. Maybe I don't remember. It's we have to ask him the story. Chick. It's wild, right? But that was like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, New York in the '80s was a little bit like a freaking Charles Bronson Death yeah. Wish movie. You know what I mean? Okay. It was like a little wild, right? Um, so, you know, my mom wasn't going to take me to Manhattan, Chinatown to go get a bunch of movies and stuff. So <laughs> oh, I didn't yes. see that stuff until much later. Mm. Did like the, you know, Jackie Chan performing the eight drunken immortals. Uh, I, I didn't, I didn't really imitate that stuff. And I think that for people who do martial arts seriously, mm -hmm. I was already learning Wing Chun as a teenager. I didn't have this thing like, oh, I need to teach myself martial arts from these movies because yeah, I was, I was, doing, had a, I was doing that. A certified right? instructor teacher. Yeah, so yeah. I, I was like, you know, I want like, you know, who, who, who didn't like, you know, learn to throw up the drunken master hands or who didn't learn how to like create the snake yeah. shapes, you know? Um, but that doesn't mean like, I wasn't like really that serious about it. The stuff that I would learn, like if I wanted to learn stuff outside of my wheelhouse, mm -hmm. um, I got proper instructional tapes. Mm. So like as a teenager, I would order like, you know, back then you would have to go to the martial art magazines and like, or, you know, order the tapes. Right. And they had the little order form and you had to cut the order form yeah. out of the magazine and right. fill it and send a check and mail it in. And then, wow. then it was the waiting game for a few weeks until that thing came in and you had these video cassettes. So when I wanted to, I was doing non-classical Wing Chun in, in my teen years. And I wanted to learn something about like traditional Wing Chun or classical Wing Chun. Mm -hmm. So I bought like Augustine Fong had this like tape series, which was like, I think eight tapes from Panther videos. Sifu where he, Gratos is Sifu. Yeah, where yeah. he shows the whole system. So like I ordered all eight tapes. So it had like the weapons and the dummy and all the basics and cheese out and it yeah. forms and everything. Um, and I got like some of Paul Vunak's videos like from Jeet Kune Do. I've heard of him too. Yeah, Paul Vunak's an absolute psychopath, absolute stud. Yeah. And I got some like the very early Brazilian Jiu Jitsu videos, which didn't really show that much. There was one guy on Panther who had like a Navy SEALs training video and then also a BJJ video with, I think with Joe Moreira, who mm -hmm. was one of the early guys. So, you know, that's why I kind of learned my early guillotine chokes and stuff yeah. as a teenager or whatever. And um, I got Judo Jean LaBelle video where mm -hmm. he shows all the, I, I was, it was finishing holds. And then I ordered it, and what I didn't realize, it was all pro wrestling finishing holds. <laughs> all right, so it's like like Boston Crab kind of shit, right? Uh, but it was so funny. We used to watch it. We, we used to watch that Gene LaBelle video all the time, just because it was freaking hysterical. Yeah. But I, I got it thinking I was going to learn some cool like finishing holds, and it was all just, all just like ridiculous. Mm. It was like Boston Crab shit and stuff. Yeah. like that. it was just ridiculous. Speaking right? of uh, guillotine chokes, mm -hmm. that finish by Nate Diaz. Oh yeah, that's on right. On Tony Ferguson. Ferguson. Yeah, wow. crazy. Watch a bunch of two old men fight. It's like <laughs> Nate Diaz is thirty seven. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Seven years younger than me. And he's he's fighting like an yeah. old pop star. I think people don't realize like it's been a lot of um, well, when it, yeah. well, when it comes to sport fighting, there's an expiration date. It's not like defending yourself. Practicing martial arts is something you can do your entire life. Yeah. And you can do it at a fairly high level. And you can still 
whoop some ass into your old age or whatever, but going into the ring, mm-hmm. all right, or going to a sporting contest. Animal. You def- <laughs> exactly, Mikey. Yeah. You de- there's definitely an expiration date uh, to, to that stuff, just mm. where the body's just not fully going to operate at that level the way you want it to. So, um, yeah, so that, that, that was interesting. But no, I mean, I, I definitely uh, uh, took inspiration from, from films. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also was... I was, even as a teenager, was very pragmatic. You know, like if I saw Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. Yeah. And there's Jason Scott Lee doing his stuff on the wooden dummy. Well, I knew that stuff wasn't real. Because I had seen what the actual wooden dummy stuff looked like from like the Mm. Yip Man books. Okay. Even though I had not learned the wooden dummy that time. And like from Augustine Fong videos. and, And so, I, you know, when I would see like, you know... Jason Scott Lee hitting the wooden dummy in some weird way and drag like I didn't go go like oh whoa that's cool I go he's not a martial artist that's not real Wing Chun mm. so I would never look at that. I would never go like oh no I now let me slow down the tape and then show myself the wooden dummy that Jason Scott Lee did in Dragon the Bruce Lee story like Damn. that just did not interest me at all even back then because I knew that that wasn't the thing so uh, yeah so we got uh, we got time for one short one yeah one, one short, short one. one just like me I'm a short one. <laughs> Okay. Me personally. Okay. <laughs> Next up, we got Will Williams. Will Williams. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a name I used to give a cop when I got caught skateboarding as a teenager. <laughs> You're gonna have to get out of here. I don't want you skateboarding here ever again. What's your name, son? So I'll put it on the list. Will Williams. <laughs> It's like a Marvel Comics um, yeah. like kind of character. He's probably a superhero. You know the Marvel Comics like Kirk, Kirk like, right. and the villains. Peter Parker. Like Peter Parker, Kirk Con- Connors, Mark, Matt Murdock. Right, mm-hmm. right. You know what I mean? yeah. Bruce Banner. Yeah. 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 Will Williams. Mike, yeah. Mikey Mean. All right, let's go. Jake Jacobson. Dre Dryson. Oh, <laughs> what? That's All not right. in real. Let's go. All right. Hey, KFG team. I have a question about a bunch of kung fu videos I see on IG, TikTok, etc. Why are they always sped up? It's not usually anything crazy, but they speed it up about a 0.25 and expect people not to notice. Uh Thank you in advance. Yeah, um, because that guy that you're talking about, the guy we all know on IG with the slick hair in China, who's always walking around to school and people attack him randomly. Yeah. Like, I don't know why anyone thinks that's real. If you have a martial arts school and you're the Sifu, why would your students attack you at random? And they're always, <laughs> like, like, it doesn't make any sense. And, th- and then he's just beating people who are not good. Okay, the reason why that's sped up uh-huh. is because he's just an actor. And, mm. and he has a production company behind him that are producing these things so that he can become viral and they can make money. He's not a real Wing Chun guy that anyone has ever heard of. And that's all I got to say about that. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, if you have questions for me to answer on a future episode, go ahead and write them in the comments below. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius, hit that bell for notifications. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a Kung Fu Genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Kung, and I produce masters. You surpassed us, your Kung Fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the victor. Jay, on please. Oh, turn it on. Yeah. Every now and then I'm <laughs> even a little. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Turn oh, it on. Also, Dre, turn what? your headphones around. What the f***ing shit, man? That's some pro shit right there. Boom. <laughs> Here comes amateur shit. Now comes amateur ass. hour. Now comes amateur hour. Amateur you night at the call Apollo. You should call the old, uh, Ernie Anastas, you know, keep f***ing that chicken. All right, peeps. Keep f***ing that chicken. Lots, Lots of, of gems. gems. Lots of keep f***ing chickens. Jesus. No? All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of Amin post stepping. No, nah, it should be Sifu Amin. Lots yeah. of just Sifu. Say, just say Sifu Amin because you're going to fuck his last Imin. name. Sifu Amin. Lots of gems, lots of Sifu Amin looking like Rambo 3 up in here. Lots of, you know that IG guy sped up. Oh, oh get the fuck out of here. Lots of gems. Lots of Sifu Emin looking like Rambo 3 up in here. Lots of, you know that Sifu on it. And ah, you know that, uh, in that, what's the, you know that Instagram guy? This is too complicated for Dre.
Yeah, this is a very complicated intro. Lots of gems. Lots of Sifu Imin looking like Rambo 3 up in here. Lots of, you know that Wing Chun guy on Instagram? All sped up, you wanna know why? Cause he's a bullshit artist. Let's get. No, you don't like that? You gotta say that with, um, what, 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 is the, what do the kids say nowadays? With big dick energy. No, that, that, was, um, that, was, that was three years ago. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Hey, you well killed done. it on that one. Killed it. You got that Yo, big I put that big dick energy, energy big in there. Big dick energy. Big dick energy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,